Fiona and Terrell Givens, welcome to Mormon Discussion. How are you guys today? Very well, Bill. Thank you so much. Good. Excellent. Good. Thanks. Good. Glad to have you on. Uh, my listeners are going to know who you are, but maybe just as a touch of background, uh, tonight we're sitting down with Terrell and Fiona Givens, uh, authors of The Crucible of Doubt, Reflections on the Quest for Faith, and wanted to sit and just talk with you about the book. And, and if you don't mind, we'll just jump right into it. Sure. That's, that's fine. Wonderful. Uh, Fiona, you've mentioned in the past, uh, in other places where you've, where you've spoken publicly that you were originally, uh, growing up, you were Catholic and you converted to the LDS faith. And some of my listeners wrote in and they were curious of, of how difficult a transition that was. I mean, was there? That was extraordinarily was difficult. Yeah, I was going to ask the struggle with family, the the transition just in giving up some things and taking on new things, but specifically in family dynamics. What was that like? Um, devastating, to be quite honest. I'm, I still haven't recovered from it. Um, no, it it haunts me. It sits there always. Uh, sense of loss, familial loss. Yeah, it came at great cost. Is is there still an effort to try and fix some of that, or is it just kind of the way it is? Is the way it is. It's the way it is. Um, I'm an embarrassment to my family, and they had high expectations for me. So um, they, they're just not quite sure the topic is not raised. Uh, and then they occasionally forget that I am Mormon. And uh, um, my my sister-in-law said, Leah, Leah said, okay, there's a great new show in town. It's called, called The Book of Mormon. She said, it's so fun. Everybody is saying it's really funny, Fiona. You need to come with me. And she completely forgotten that I was Mormon. It was just interesting. You know, it was just so sometimes they forget, um, would rather forget. Right. And, and I can relate to that. Um, when I joined the church, my family is not religious at all. And yet, because of those, what I thought were positive changes, my family kicked me out. And, and it wasn't until my wife and I uh, had our first child that my mom specifically welcomed us back in and and wrapped her arms around us. It took a grandchild to do that. And, and there was a lot of hard moments. And, and I, so I can certainly relate to that and, and can still feel kind of in your voice some of the, the, the struggle with that. And, uh, and anyway, my heart goes out to you because those, it is a tough, it is a tough situation to, to leave one's faith for another because you think it's the right thing that you're doing. And yet others feel like you've, in a sense, betrayed them and, and the faith that, that you held on to prior. So, uh, Terrell, the, uh, there's a scripture and Elder Holland has used this. The scripture talks about the, uh, the day when the very elect shall be deceived. And, and I don't like using the term that way, but many see today as that day. Um, do you sense that the number of those who were once deeply committed to the gospel that are now leaving the church over a loss of faith, that that is a bigger than maybe it's ever been before? Well, I have that impression. And of course, all of our, Evidence is just anecdotal, personal experience. Uh, but yeah, I don't like. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't use that term "deceived" either. I prefer the the language of Luke when he refers to the last days and talks about perplexity that shall be rampant. And I think that's a better characterization of where we are today as a church. That many of our members are in a state of perplexity as they try to cope with the onslaught of new information and uh, and more transparency, more honesty, and forthrightness in the telling of our history. Yeah, and maybe a follow up to that. Um, I know that at times we'll we'll see someone who's losing their faith and and maybe stepping back from the church or even leaving the church altogether. And and some will just brand them as the tares in the wheat and tares parable, or just say, you know, hey, sorry, but I guess you know, you know, the Lord's going to sort out His vineyard, and some are going to be lost, and almost look at it as, hey, I'm. I'm better than they are because I have faith and they've lost it. Maybe just speak for a moment to to why that really doesn't work and that does more damage than it does help. Well, it doesn't work for a number of reasons. First of all, because in the enumeration of spiritual gifts in section 46 of the Doctrine and Covenants, knowledge that Jesus is the Christ is one spiritual gift, but so is the capacity to merely believe in, uh, enumerated as a separate gift. So I don't see that there's any uh, hierarchy of gifts in terms of which one is more valuable. I think that we need people to ask hard questions in a church or in a culture. I think we need people who aren't satisfied to skim along at the surface and probe deeply. And I think that the kind of course correction that our culture is engaged in right now is ultimately uh, a very positive and will prove to be a very healthy thing. Right, right. Um, Fiona, do you feel like we're at a place where questions are really welcome? I'm, of course, I'm a member of the church, and I 
I've gone through this faith transition. I found your book to be very, uh, very positive for me. And, and, uh, I've started my faith transition probably about five years ago. And there were moments where I was ready to leave the church because the way I had set it up, and of course your book deals a lot with paradigms and assumptions. A lot of my assumptions and paradigms were just flat out wrong. And when I discovered new information, all of a sudden that came crashing down. And I'm hopeful because I hear the rhetoric in the church changing to where questions are, at least verbally they're saying questions are welcome. Are we to a place yet where questions really are absolutely no ifs, ands, or buts allowed? Well, I think we're entering an age of nuance, which I think is extraordinarily healthy. Um, you know, we, we've bifurcated the wickedness and the good, the wicked and the good for so long. Uh, we tend to see um, things in black and white religious language when in actual fact you ask yourself, so who are the wicked? And the wicked always comprise the they. And that they are not I. <laughs> One never considers oneself right. wicked. Um, so I, I think this is really healthy um, on many levels, um, um, interreligious levels. I think it's really important for us to um, be looking at other faiths with um, much more compassionate eyes uh, as to what they are contributing. And also particularly, I think, as I said, we've a entered this age of nuance. And so, so things are not so clear cut. And that is actually more realistic than the way we have been looking um, at things as a culture. Right, right. I, I know in... Again, in other places where you've spoken, you've talked about there's certain things that you just consider absolutes. Like there's a lot of things that are up in the air for you that you have faith in or that you hope in. But you also said there are some things you have a firm testimony of, and one of those is the Savior. And I had one listener write me, and I, I, I asked all my listeners, if anybody who had a question, to please send it to me. And I wanted to, to make sure that I address their questions more than the ones that I had. And I like, I'm like you in that there are some things that I am pretty firm in that I'm as close to know as probably I could be without an angelic visitor showing up in the room. And, and so I have that same kind of testimony that you talk about in regards to Heavenly Father or to the Savior. But I had one listener write in who said, I don't have that. And he, and he says, I want you to ask Fiona how she got to the place that she had that and if some of the advice she has on how she got there might be helpful for how I can get there. Uh, any thoughts? Well, I'm not going to be particularly helpful, really. We go back to Section 46 and the idea of gifts. And to every person, a gift is given. And all of the gifts are going to be different because we're different people and we need to make up the body of Christ. So it makes sense that everybody will be given a different gift. The, the gift to know that Jesus is the Christ happens to be my gift. I was born with it. I was born with it. Um, and so when I was confirmed a member of the church, all I think that happened there was um, sort of an empowerment of that gift, a much stronger realization that this was indeed a gift and that I had a responsibility now. Um, you know, to, to proclaim my love for the Savior, to proclaim that he was Jesus the Christ. But, and so, I, you know, how I, 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 I always had it. And I, I think all of us are born with a particular gift, kindness, patience, gentleness, whatever it is. Um, and I just happen to feel that those are gifts of the Spirit that are um, strengthened, perhaps, um, where it's sort of stamped, maybe, um, when we are confirmed in the church. Yeah, and I and I hear that, and I and I totally agree, and I see things that same way. I had my faith crisis when I was serving as a bishop. That's when it came on, and I had another member of my ward who heard me give a, a presentation for a fireside on the Book of Mormon, and, and I briefly talked about seer stones. And the member came up to me afterwards, and he was he was ecstatic that somebody else in the ward was speaking his same language that knew some of these these problematic issues or or nuances in church history that most members are unaware of, or at least used to be a few years back. And he made mention to me, he said, you know, I, I've, I've prayed and I've fasted for days on end. I've, I've spent months seeking out answers and yet nothing comes to me. And, and I feel almost bad telling him that I, I put very little work in. Like you, it was just something that came natural that every time I started to drift away from a belief in God, and, I, and I'm a convert to the church, so 
I was essentially empty up until a certain, certain point. But once I joined the church, I had a really strong testimony of the Savior, and it came pretty easily. And in moments where I've started to drift away, I've had deep spiritual experiences which have brought me right back to that center. And and yet some seem to seek those things out with all their might, with all the fervor of their heart, and and those things don't come. And maybe if you could just speak for a moment to the the empathy we should have for others as they're going through that, and and for us not to look at others as as being less faithful. I know you guys are talking about DNC forty six a lot, but I I think even outside of saying that over and over, some members just don't seem to get it. They're just not empathetic to those who aren't getting answers. Yeah, I, you know, it, that's, it's such a difficult thing. Um, I, and then I, I have to go back to section 46 because it is a restoration of scripture. You know, to some is given to believe and to some is to, you know, to know that these things are true and to some is to given to believe on their words. So you have that belief thing, which is really, really important. It's huge. And then you have that wonderful, um, uh, story in Mark where this man comes to Jesus, Jesus pleading for the life of his son, that he would heal his son. And, you know, Jesus turns and asks him if he has faith, and he says, yes, I have faith. And you know, he looks into Christ's eyes. Christ looks into his eyes. He doesn't have any faith. Um, he has no faith that Jesus is the Christ. I'm not even sure if he was, you know, knew that God existed. But at that point, what what the what the father said was so important. You know, he just looked at the Savior and said, help thou mine unbelief. And the Savior responded to his unbelief by healing his son. So I, I think it's important for those of us on this harrowing faith journey. And I have friends in the church who've never had a, a testimony that, that God exists, that Jesus is the Christ, or many of the other things um, which, which re- really resonate with me. Um, and, and that is, it, it, the empathy is really important. And it goes back to our baptismal covenant, which is I think is so cool. Because the very first thing we are commanded to do is to help each other carry our burdens. So every single one of us might be given a gift. Some of them we, we don't even notice we have. But we all know that we have burdens. We all feel that we are carrying them each individually. And so if we looked at each other as somebody carrying their cross, trying to follow the Savior, and we look at each other as, well, what can I do? You know, my, my friend does not believe that there is a God. So what can I do in my life to help my friend not necessarily come to a belief in God, but to carry that burden, to to think, what, what, if, what would it be in my universe if I did not know there was a God or if I did not have a belief in a God? So it's really a call, and I think it's a divine mandate to us to develop empathy. If we do not have it, we should definitely be attempting to develop it. Right, right, to realize that one having a stronger belief or a lesser belief may be no indication of the effort that that person is making. I, I appreciate that. I, I'm speaking today with Terrell and Fiona Givens, uh, authors of The Crucible of Doubt. Um, Terrell, the book, and I mentioned this earlier, it tackles more of the assumptions and the paradigms that we make. It doesn't, it doesn't really tackle the specific issues head on as far as being like an, a work of apologetics in that sense. It's, it's more and I don't want to use this word in a negative way, I mean this very positively, but more philosophical, more kind of hitting at the the overarching themes. Um, maybe just for a moment speak for the reason why making the book tackled in that way rather than hit the issues specifically one by one. Well, I think the, <clears throat> that what occurred to us is we have had more and more conversations with people facing faith challenges was that often we aren't attentive enough to what the real question underlying our perplexity is. Uh, I'll I'll just give you an example. Someone may ask, uh, what is the true story of, you know, Joseph Smith and polygamy? Did he, did he exercise at times spiritual coercion? Did he, did he marry a woman under this or that circumstance? The real question that underlies that, it seems to me, is what is the proper set of expectations we should bring to bear when it comes to prophetic, the prophetic calling? And so rather than, than you know, mess about in the, the leaves and branches of the problem, it seems more fruitful to get down to the root of the problem. I'm reminded of a conversation that Brigham Young had with a priest before he had even met Joseph Smith. That priest was going on alleging one thing and another about Joseph Smith's character. And Brigham Young responded with these words, 
he said he said I don't care if he acts like the devil if he's brought forth if he has brought forth the doctrine that will save us he may get drunk every day of his life he can sleep with his neighbor's wife every night he can run horses and gamble I don't care anything about that for I never embrace any man in my faith but the doctrine he has produced will save you and me and the whole world and if you can find fault with that then find it I mean, that's a, that's a magnificent position right. for Brigham Young to have occupied. As I said, before he even met the prophet, he realized you don't join a faith because of the man. It's because of the message and whatever keys or powers that man has served as an instrument to restore to the earth. So, you know, the question of exactly whether or not Joseph was always upright and, and, and acted in appropriate ways is is irrelevant, ultimately, to my faith in the doctrines of the Restoration. Right. Beautiful, beautiful. I, uh, I also had a listener who, was, who I know, I know him from having other conversations with him uh, online in regards to, to the church. And here's what he had to say. He said, I held on to my activity for a long time and tried to be a part of the Uchtdorf Givens approach to Mormonism. In the end, I decided to stop attending. My beliefs and the teachings from the conference pulpit and lesson manuals are so far apart that I was faced faced with two options. Then he, he also gives a third option, too, which is what he's done. He says, option number one, I can become a voice of contradiction nearly every week and disrupt the work of others in preparing a lesson. Or number two, I can sit silent and in so doing, uh, give tacit endorsement of what is being said or taught. Uh, and then he says, number three is what I chose to do uh, what he has done, which is stop attending and hence not add to the hurt or damage and confusion of others, but also protect his ability to to speak up since he's not there. He doesn't have to. Uh, he says this, he says the people at church are my friends. Should a friend really be a negative and naysaying influence? My friends don't go to church to have the heretic in the corner challenge and undermine their faith. My close friend, the branch president doesn't want the negativity either. So is there a place for the genuine me or must I simply sit in silence if I choose to eventually return to full activity? Your thoughts? Um, absolutely. There is a place. It's, it's, a, it's a really important place because his leaving has left a void. Um, I, I think we are under the injunction to speak truth, but we speak truth in love. And I think your friend, um, uh, your, your, uh, the person who's asked the question, um, is, is um, intuiting a paradigm that may not necessarily be there, that if he raises an objection to what is being taught in the lesson, that he is therefore being negative. Um, that's, not, that's not true at all. Uh, just a, a, an example. Um, first of all, we are, we are a community-based church. We are a service-based church. So I think that's one of the strengths of our community is that um, we, we serve each other. You know, we, we take casseroles, take care of children, one thing and another. And I think that's really important to do when, you, when you're a ward. That I th- is probably the most important thing to do, actually, is to serve the other ward members as well as the community because you build up street cred um, when you do that. So, for example, when the question was asked, how do we prepare ourselves to go to the temple, I suggested, and I did say, I know this probably sounds a little unorthodox, but it might be helpful for people to attend Mass two or three times before they go to the temple because Catholics do liturgy and symbolism extraordinarily well. And, you know, it was just interesting to watch the group. Some thought, well, that's an interesting idea. Some thought, well, I'm not so sure about that. But the fact of the matter is they knew me. Um, they knew of my love for them and I knew of their love for me. And um, so it was fine. So I, I think there there is a place and there has to be in a place for authenticity. For example, the sacram- uh, the fast and testimony meeting. Uh, I think most of our sacrament fast and testimony meetings, excuse me, are flat because they're inauthentic. Um, the spirit can only bear testimony to the truth of what is being said. So if we go up to the podium and just reel off platitudes, there is going to be nothing there. Nothing is going to be felt. It's only when we bear authentic testimony, like I know this, I'm not sure about this, I hope this, I would love this to be true. When the real self is speaking, only then can the testament, the the the, the spirit testify to the truth of what is being said because that is that person's truth and everybody is uplifted and edified so so that's you know for all of all of your listeners who are wondering what 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 is my role in the church um the role is an absolutely vital one participatory edifying teaching yeah 
I, I love that, Fiona, and I, I think, as you're pointing out, it's much more based on the tone that we use. So it's one thing to, to disagree or to have an objection. It's another thing to go into a meeting and try to uh, prove everybody wrong and, and be, be, I guess, dogmatic in your own way about it, but rather to come in kind of kindly and to offer an alternative. And I, and I want to follow that up. This is kind of along the same lines. I don't want to feel like I'm asking the same question twice. But a listener said this, and I think it hits it from a different angle. Uh, in the church, there is this tension. We have talks that say, do not criticize, even if the criticism is true. We have other talks that say, follow the brethren, even if they are wrong. And yet many of us are deeply struggling and trying to live as close uh, to those ideals as we can so as to avoid damaging relationships at church, but also remaining authentic, which is a word we used earlier, which I think is important, and to be self-honest and to uh, and to be a help heading in the direction to where we need to go. And I'll use an example. Um, and I don't, and I'm not doing this to be critical. I'm doing this just to kind of lay out an idea of where we can kind of say this is where it happens. In the last general conference, uh, one of the general authorities talked about Jesus being born on April 6th. And right away online in some of the discussion boards, I'm like, hey, that, that doesn't really sound, that doesn't really sound accurate. Uh, knowing some things that I've read, I know that there's more room for that position than the one that was taken. The moment I did that, I had a number of Latter-day Saints who are deeply aware of the issues come right out immediately and say, you can't say that. You cannot say that something that was said from leaders is possibly wrong. You you have no right to do that. So how do I how do I live authentically, Terrell, and and still handle still handle when I know that I have a position that has value being able to share that position? Well, you know, I saw some people online that handled this question in a way that I thought was was both wise and diplomatic. They said, well, on the question of the Savior's birth, here's what various of the brethren have said. And then they show that there is also a tradition of brethren who have spoken out and, and got the date more right, uh, historically speaking, and gave a little bit of historical background to explain why the we, we probably shouldn't take literally the indication in the Doctrine and Covenants that April 6th was the exact day uh, of the Savior's birth 2014 years ago. Uh, in, in other words, I think it's always useful to appeal to history and to precedent to, to try to set context and to try to set contrasts and comparisons rather than speaking as oneself being a voice of authority. But I think it also, it just has to do with tone. Um, let me just, if I can, I just want to share with you one of my very favorite um, quotations. It comes actually from Juanita Brooks's father when she was apparently expressing to him her exasperation and, and the, the problem of dissent. Of course, most people recognize her name as somebody who, at the time she was researching the Mount Meadows Massacre, that was a very welcome voice. But here's what her father said to her. He said, now look, I'm a cowboy. He said, and what I've learned is that one who rides counter to the herd is trampled and killed. One who only trails behind means little because he leaves all responsibility to others. It's the cowboy who rides the edge of the herd, who sings and calls and makes himself heard, who helps direct the course. Happy sounds are generally better than cursing. But there are times when he must maybe swear a little and swing a whip or lariat to round an astray or turn the leaders. So don't lose yourself and don't ride away and desert the outfit. Ride the edge of the herd and be alert. But know your directions and call out loud and clear. Chances are you won't make any difference. But on the other hand, you just might. Um, you know, Teddy Roosevelt said it a lot simpler when he said it's, it's the person who stays in the arena to struggle that makes the difference. And I, I think that, you know, there's no they there. We, we, we keep talking about the church as this monolithic entity that speaks with one voice. And there's one dominant message and tone. That, and that's just not true. Even among the quorum, among the leadership, there's great variation. It's a, it's a symphony of different voices. It's not a megaphone of one. And so I think that there is, there is much more room for variety, variability of, of interpretation and nuance than we sometimes think. And uh, we are the church. We are all the body of Christ, which means we all have the power to nudge our culture in one direction or another. Right. And I, and I like that. And, and I struggle to do that. I'm, I'm much more one who wants to jump up and down and make lots of noise so that people hear the, the alternative voice. But in reality, if you really want to be listened to, you've got to, you've got to come along a little, a little more friendly, I guess, than sometimes the, the way I take things and, and do things. I, and I appreciate that. There was, there was a listener who asked kind of a follow up question to this. Um, they were talking about the same interview that Elder Oaks gave where he talked about, uh, not all, 
criticism, uh, you know, not all truth is, is useful. I think it came from President Packer and then Elder Oaks talked about uh, criticism, even if it's true, is not something that we should be doing. And there's obviously a new period that the church is entering. We've talked about that already. I, just recently this week, I saw an article about the Church History Museum is going to close down for a year and completely revamp. And the article in Deseret News, which I did not expect to see them word it this way there, the the one of the people with the museum said, the church is entering an age where it is trying to be more transparent than it has been in the past. Uh, and I know we've got you know new manuals, gospel topic essays. Do you see the adult curriculum coming soon? It, it, this is a question I think I may have asked you before, uh, Terrell, but between either you or Fiona is... Do we know if new manuals are coming for the adults and if that's on the way? I think they are. They've, the, the new in, seminary institute manuals already reflect changes. They are going to actually address head-on topics that have never been addressed before, like, like polygamy. Uh, multiple accounts of the first vision. Um, my understanding is that those uh, changes, modifications, are going to infiltrate the adult curriculum as well. Uh, I, I do know, I think many people have spoken in public already about a new church history, uh, multi-volume history that is underway, has been underway for a few years. That is going to become the new standard history of the church. It's going to be uh, much more uh, well transparent. It's going to give a much fuller accounting of church history. And that's going to be a standard source, I understand, for future manuals and curricula. So, I mean, every single change, every single development that we see uh, concerned with church history, I think is going in the right direction. I, th- awesome. I think, Bill, what you, that the word that you used was criticism. And I think it's, I think it's seen very negatively. Um, and so if it, if it is such a negatively empowered um, word, I think we should drop it. Um, and just change it somewhat. If you change the angle, like call it a critique. A critique is something that you do, um, it, it, it engages your intelligence, it engages your um, educational background, um, the things that you know about the history and you don't know about the history. So, you know, I, I think people are, are, are upset because they think that whenever they, they have a, a different um, viewpoint on the history of the church, for example, that they do know that there were multiple visions, that they do know that Joseph practiced polyandry, that that somehow in and of itself is a criticism. It's, it's not. It's not a criticism at all. It's just adding to the conversation. And I think the Doctrine and Covenants is really good about the, how we should conduct Sunday school. And we've come completely away from that. Whereas, you know, the, the time was when we were supposed to let every person have their chance to speak I think that's extraordinary not to ask questions but we definitely have a schoolroom environment in our church which wasn't there to begin with and we've just sort of culturally crept into this whereas the teacher is supposed to have all of the answers the teacher's a layperson the teacher's your next door neighbor the teacher probably has no more um um, historical knowledge of, of, of the beginning of the church than the next person in the next pew. Um, so we are a lay church, and I think because we are a lay church, we need to treat each other gently. And I, I guess it goes back to turn, but turn, but also to love. You know that, that this person is obviously not as aware of the history as you are. So how do we do that? How do we elevate the conversation in the class by being authentic? And there are so many ways that we can offer a critique of what is being said rather than a criticism of the leader um, or a criticism of the teacher. Awesome. I'm speaking today with Fiona and Terrell Givens, authors of The Crucible of Doubt, a wonderful book, and we're going to speak about where our listeners can find that in just a moment. Uh, Fiona, how, how have you and Terrell raised your kids so that you've prepared them, and obviously there's always the risk, but prepared them the best you could so that so that they don't run into a, a faith crisis so deep that they feel their only choice is to walk away? Well, I'm not sure that we have. <laughs> you know, I, I, we, we have children in faith crisis and um, family members who are absolutely. Uh, what we tried to do was, um, you know, just, just you know, ha- have conversations with the children coming home from church on Sundays. You know, what, what did you talk about in Sunday school today? And then, and then course correct. Um, and then there was a seminary and institute, and that was every day. And by the end of the day, the children had forgotten completely what they had learned that day, or I'd forgotten to ask because it was at the end of the day and I was too tired. So, you know, what one one does the best one can. And then at the end of the day, one loves one's children. 
you know, one just loves one's children. And um, that that's really the the only thing that I can say about this. We, we tried. Um, it wasn't successful in every case, but we do love our children and they know that we love them. So that's good. Right. And, and I want to maybe follow that up. I had this one to ask maybe a little later on, but I think it's pertinent to what we're talking about. There are many in the church when they, when they lose faith and they, they tell that to their, their spouse or their parents or their children, they're met with, um, a, a defensiveness which drives an even deeper wedge in that relationship. Any thoughts on those? And you, you talked about this earlier, Fiona, but is there any thoughts from either of you on, on how we can be more careful to protect family relationships, even in the midst when one person in that, that relationship is losing faith and stepping away or stepping back from the church or reexamining things? Well, I, I think, it, Bill, I think it goes back to culture again. Um, quite honestly, if our testimonies have been built upon the history of the church, which we learned in Sunday school and seminary and institute, we are on very, very shaky ground <laughs> because the new history coming out right. shows that we are. So for me, that the defensiveness isn't anger or a sense of self-righteousness or you are bad or you sinned or whatever, but it's fear. It's fear because one senses that you sense the truth of the, per- of the thing the person is saying um, or it, it um, invades your truth space. And so it's going to make you feel very scared. And people who are scared react very badly. They generally react in anger. So that being said, it's really horrible when the anger is directed at you. You have to t- take a step back and think, oh, you can't always do that. But I think if we understand that we're, we're all operating from a fear base, this um, just just let it go. Just let it go. And the bottom line is we love each other. So it's okay. Take a deep breath. And, you know, you're my son. You're my daughter. You're my dad. I love you. We can work through this together. <clears throat> That's the mentality I think would be most helpful. Right, right. No, and I, and I appreciate that. And I, I, I speak out to that same type of uh, behavior that each of us should have. We should love each other in spite of uh, – what religious preference we have or which way we see an issue of church history, that our love for each other and our empathy and kindness should go way beyond those kinds of things. I uh, I want to ask you, Terrell, uh, I had a listener who, who asked it this way. He said, he said something along the lines of, you know, we have scriptures in the church and we've been talking, you know, throughout this interview about DNC 46, 13 and 14, but we also have scriptures in Moroni 10, which says that, you know, essentially, you know, to a T, if you do this, this is what the result will be. You'll have an answer to your prayer from the Holy Ghost. We have James 1, 5, right? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who give it to all men liberally and it braideth not and it shall be given him. And, and yet you and, and many times on my podcast, I talk about DNC 46. And here's the question that this listener asks. He says, it is puzzling to me in considering the scriptures that say God will always give an answer. Why a loving Heavenly Father would not provide some people a witness they so desperately seek with the result of them leaving the church. Any thoughts on why some, I, I get the whole idea that it's a gift sometimes not to have that, but why the promise is there and why Heavenly Father doesn't seem to keep what his prophets have said at times. I'll, I'll start by saying I don't know. There's no way I can pretend <clears throat> to have an answer that is satisfactory to everybody. But I do have a few ideas that, that may be helpful. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I can't learn to read music. I have tried for years and years and years. And uh, I, I love classical guitar. I've been studying it on and off for 10 or 15 years, and I'm still in the beginner's book. <laughs> it's just not a capacity that I have. Spiritual gifts are, are like those capacities that some people have and some don't. And some of us are better at hearing the voice of God than others. I don't think that we can lay it at his feet that he doesn't speak to us. I think that for reasons that may be environmental or cultural or personal, uh, we are we we have differing capacities to hear that voice when it comes. So that's that's one explanation. Is that I think that in many times our father struggles to make himself heard to us, and we just can't still the voices and the tempests in our heart and soul sufficiently to make a space for that voice to be heard. But a second explanation, I think, is that we don't know what it is that we're listening for. I've told the experience before I had is 
as a missionary, I was I went in for my final mission interview, my release interview. And when it was all over, I said to the president, I said, you know, there's one thing that still I, uh, I, I need to talk to you about. You promised us on the day we entered this mission that if we were true and faithful and served a good mission and, and, and sought confirmation from the Spirit, we would have the Lord's assurance that our mission was accepted. And I haven't had that. And I have fasted. I've prayed. I've struggled. I don't have that. <clears throat> and he said, how do you feel about your mission? And I said, I, I feel great. I said, it's been a joyful, happy two years, and, and I go home really happy, happy and deeply satisfied with my, my, my offering. And he said to me, you don't, you don't think that's an answer? He said, did you want something more dramatic that you could consume upon your lusts? Well, I thought that was rather harsh language, and I went, <clears throat> went home a little bit chagrined. <laughs> but I've thought about that many times in the years since, and he was right. Uh, now, I didn't hear any discernible voice, but, but wasn't the stillness in my soul sufficient answer? I mean, the Doctrine and Covenants talks about the peace that comes of the Spirit, and what greater manifestation can you have than that? So I think there are just many, many, many ways that he answers our prayers that we haven't learned to decipher. Right, and, and maybe even a third idea, which you guys hit on in the book, which is the idea that you know prophets don't just have Jesus show up in the room and, and say everything into their ear that he wants them to write down but rather he gives them a thought or an impression or at times perhaps speaks face to face with them. But even in those moments when they then take those ideas and put them onto paper, they may not hit it exactly the same way as he intended that that thought to be put. I mean, am I fair saying that? Absolutely. I think the most remarkable thing about the historical department's work in recent years are these volumes they've produced, the the facsimile edition of the Revelations, for example, where you see in five different colors of ink, five different editors putting their hands to the task of improving upon Joseph Smith's revelation. Clearly, if he thought that God was dictating to him the red bat, then he wouldn't submit his revelations to the scrutiny and improvements of his peers. But he saw it as a kind of a collaborative revelatory process. He had intimations. He put it into the best language that he could. But he knew that he had never quite attained to that perfect equivalence with the intimations that he felt in his spirit. So absolutely, revelation can occur as a face-to-face encounter in a sacred But the vast majority of the time, even for Joseph, it's a struggle, a wrestle to comprehend spiritual intimations. Yeah, beautiful. And then, and also, um, Bill, you mentioned the Book of Mormon. I think one needs to remember that both Moroni and Mormon were writing from a culture of genocide. That's going to make things really black and white for you, and you you get the sense of pleading. Rather, if if you turn that away from being an injunction, you know, pray and and God will reveal the truth of this to you, to a pleading, um, because he's they're losing their entire civilization, and he looks back upon the history, and it's like you know, if we just did better, perhaps. So I th- I think reading the Book of Mormon, it has been very helpful helpful to me. Um, reading at it from that perspective to see that you know these men were writing from their culture their their life experience which was holocaust and and, and that that is really going to have in make have incredible impressions on your mind um, and you know a, a determination to try and make sure that the people who read this don't end up in the same situ- situation they are and I think that if you read that, you will see much more nuance in what seem to be commandments or what seem to be promises as rather pleadings from these men to a people that is lost and to a people that may come back. Beautiful. I uh, I wanted to ask you this, Fiona. The the ch- the church where it's at, as far as the mainstream. I mean, obviously it's come a long way in the last few years, but. There's still lots of members who believe there's an absolute position on evolution or that everything in the scriptures, specifically the creation or the fall of the garden, that everything is to be taken absolutely 100% literally. And one of the things I find that your guys' book, that it does, that I, I find to be very positive and very true, is that you show there's more room to see on these issues that there's a spectrum of positions one can take rather than just what maybe the mainstream membership says. And so on issues of whether the church has all truth or whether people are called to do God's work even outside the church, those are things that I think you guys have spoken to on several several occasions. And I find it amazing that if one's willing to dig, there are quotes from prophets and apostles that support 
these various perspectives that the mainstream doesn't seem to to grasp and and much of that comes because again some of the manuals being outdated and and some of the speculative ideas and peripheral drock doctrines that have been taught from the the 50s 60s 70s that is still kind of lingering around um fiona what are your thoughts on where we'll be in 10 or 20 years will all of this stuff by then you think be pretty much weeded out and we'll be in a place where there's a lot more room to see various perspectives oh absolutely um you're 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 absolutely right bill i mean the 50s 60s and 70s the very strong voices in those era definitely left their mark um on many people but you know just with the the coming forth of the history our our history sort of an unadulterated alloyed history um makes this type thinking almost impossible to hold on to because uh it it's just it's just not that way it's it it was a rosy history we we explain why uh joseph fielding was suffering from generational trauma he was just two generations one generation removed his his grandfather had witnessed the the bodies being brought into the home of his father and uncle and so you know when you understand that this is generational trauma his father would have told him those horrific stories and he was church historian for most of the 20th century and his primary purpose was to protect his family then one can understand why certain parts of the historical record did not come out um but we we have definitely entered a new era it's going to be painful for many people to um let go of cherished values che- well not really cherished values I, I that's incorrect cherished truths things with which one has been um been raised with but but we all have to let go <laughs> we we all have to exit the garden of eden at one point or another and it's painful and it's wrenching but that's faith journey faith journey is painful and wrenching and i think if we think that you know if we keep all the commandments we have family home evening and say our prayers and have our scripture study that everything is going to be jolly you know our own lives attest to the fact that that isn't the case and so you know it's it's okay wrenching is okay suffering is okay doubts are okay um so I i think we are i think we're entering a much more uh a more nuanced era and with that I, 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 I trust a greater empathy, a greater understanding, a greater compassion. I think it would help if we would remember in the Book of Mormon that Lehi and his family don't get a road map. They get a, mm-hmm. they get a, they get a compass. Um, that's not to say there aren't absolute truths, there aren't non-negotiables, but it means that our grasp of truth is seldom crystal clear. And we struggle along the best we can, but with no promise that we ever have a complete and comprehensive grasp of of the plan from beginning to end. Yeah. Yeah. And and maybe just to kind of run off on a little tangent of that, I, I find it remarkable in my own life. Again, I I was so I joined the church at seventeen and I was very much taught a Mormon doctrine, doctrines of salvation paradigm with which to frame the church. And as you know, that simply doesn't hold up for very long. And when it all came crashing down, I thought, you know, all of a sudden there's these 25 things that don't fit. And if these things are true, then the church can't be true. And and unfortunately, many people get to that point and they leave. But what I found for me, and I'm saying this to you maybe to get some feedback from you, but also just so the listeners hear this, what I find to be so liberating was to start dissecting these issues. So let's just take a couple. Evolution, for instance. Uh, I start looking and realizing that people like James E. Talmadge and John Whitstow and B.H. Roberts were okay with evolution. President McKay wrote somebody in a private letter saying that he was comfortable with it. When I look at issues like the garden and the fall and the creation, when I have, when I struggle with trying to figure out this no death before the fall and, and the earth maybe only being, you know, so many thousand year, years old, and then to realize that there are aspects of the fall and the creation in the garden that general authorities have said, hey, some of this is probably figurative, which gives me a lot more freedom. Uh, I think there's so many issues like that in the church where if people would just slow down and say, I know this is what I've heard for 25 years, but the reality is, is that general authorities and leaders in the church have said way more than just this one position. And once you realize there's more room out there, then all of a sudden you can kind of 
you know, spread your wings a little bit and kind of pick and choose what feels right to you. You know, Christian historians have done the same thing that Mormon historians have done. For the typical Christian, you would think that there was always just one doctrine of the Trinity. There was only always just one doctrine of the Eucharist. What happens is that it's, you know, from the perspective of of modernity, we look back and we select that one kind of linear line that goes from antiquity to the present and ignore all of the dead ends and cul-de-sacs along the way. And we've done the same thing in Mormonism. The the development and unfolding of the Restoration was at times a very complicated and and, and muddy and, and messy process. But in our manuals, of course, it's always been absolutely linear. And that's just not an accurate reflection of how we got where we are. I think it's interesting to look at Joseph Smith's own spiritual journey because he starts off and, you know, he's reading the Bible literally. But by the end of his life, um, he's saying that there are many things in the Bible that do not agree with, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, with what the Holy Spirit whispers to me is true. So you can watch his own um, evolution as far as faith is concerned. So he starts off, you know, with a a very primitive view. I I don't want to offend people by saying that, but, um, you know, a more literalistic view of of the Bible. By the end, um, he's looking at scripture a very different way. He's actually discerning for himself that there, there, there are real problems here. He can't solve them all, but he recognizes that they are there. Awesome. And it perhaps opens the door for us to solve them, which is really lovely. I mean, I, that's, what, that's what I love about restoration. I think a lot of us believe that the restoration sort of happened and then stopped. <laughs> and I, I fear that we're becoming like, you know, the, the people who were um, contemptuously accosted in the Book of Mormon by saying a Bible, a Bible, you think you've got a Bible and I can't say anything else. I think as Mormons, we've, we, we tend to fall into the trap of, of saying, OK, we've got a Bible and a Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and, put, and we don't need anything else. And it's like, no, that's not what restoration is about. I hear from Joseph's teachings that this is unfolding. And I think actually we've taken a little hiatus and we're sort of in a restoration of the restoration period. It's like it's interesting that the founding fathers, their idea of um, theology is, is coming back. It was lost, this idea of a vulnerable God that um, that, that um, Heavenly Father has um, contrived a plan, a plan whereby every human being will return to his presence. Those sort of things have been lost in the intervening years. So I, I think it's really interesting that we seem to be involved in a restoration of restoration. Uh, I just a few months ago interviewed Elder McConkie's, Bruce R. McConkie's nephew. Uh, I forget his first name. It's slipping my mind at the moment. But he's written a couple of books. And it's not Joseph Fielding, which is his son. It was, it was a nephew of his. And he said there was a, a funny story he came across about Brigham Young, where Brigham Young asked a minister if he believed the Bible and the minister's response was every word of it. And Brigham Young's response was, well, then you're a bigger believer than I am. And I, th- I think again, as you're hitting on Fiona, that there's, there's just room to, to see things differently. And, and that while some members of the church do take things very literally, and that's the paradigm they're in. And we certainly don't want to crash that at the same time, there's nothing wrong. The leaders have given us room to not take everything literally and to have a lot more room. And so we're talking today with Terrell and Fiona Givens, authors of The Crucible of Doubt. And I just think your book just does that beautifully. Every chapter speaks on this higher level of just opening things up and allowing there to be room to hold various positions. I I want to ask one more question, and, th- and this may be kind of a tough one, because um, I've, I've heard you, Terrell, speak on this before, that this, for you in your mind anyway, is a position that really can't be be given up. But I had a member of the church who does not see the Book of Mormon as historical, but they want to be Mormon, and they certainly believe the Book of Mormon is uplifting, and in their own way, they would define it as scripture, just not historical scripture. Is there room in, he wants to know, is there room in the church for people like him? Sure, I think there's room in the church for people like that. <clears throat> I think that we, you know, we've been told we shouldn't pick and choose what principles of the gospel we we accept, <clears throat> but we all vary in the kinds of testimonies that we have. We all have different strength testimonies of different principles. You know, I I may absolutely know that tithing works, and you may absolutely know that fasting works. And, you know, we give our assent to the totality, but that one doesn't have a burning testimony to historicity of the Book of Mormon um, is, seems to me, not, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a deal breaker. 
It's, it's, just, gotcha. it's interesting, Bill, because you quoted Brigham Young and um, Michael Reed wrote this fabulous book um, entitled Banishing the Cross, The Emergence of a New um, Mormon Taboo. And uh, he he talks about Brigham Young, and this is a really delightful story. Brigham Young is having a conversation with a Catholic priest, and um, then after the conversation, he said, well, I, I didn't move him at all as I propounded my faith position, but if he'd gone on a little bit longer, I think he would have convinced me of his. So, you know, I, I, I think that's such a wonderful, refreshing way. It's like, okay, Catholicism or this uh, or Buddhism or Islam or whatever has some very very strong positions so much so for Brigham that he was almost persuaded that hmm you know so, and that's that's wonderful when you have you know Brigham Young of all people you know if people uh, tend not to think of being broad minded um, you know ready to to hear and listen and um, and not be frightened of the truths that were coming to him from another faith tradition, another paradigm. I, I think that speaks so well of of our faith, of, of the, the founding tenets of our faith, and that, yes, there's, uh, there's room for everyone um, in our faith tradition. Bill, let me just add a word if I can. Just I, I want to make sure. sure that I'm not misunderstood. I personally do believe in the historicity of the Book of Mormon, and I think that it's difficult to maintain an intellectually consistent position that denies it because of what I call the Moroni problem. But I think it's also important to point out that uh, it's not a Temple Recommend question, so clearly the leadership of the church doesn't feel that it is a non-qualifier uh, for uh, to be fellowshipped in the church. Yeah, and I agree with that. I, I too hold the Book of Mormon to be historical, and I find that if you let that go, it, it, it's hard to keep everything else hinged together and to still see God involved if everything is in a sense of fraud up to that point. And, and so I totally recognize that. I, I want to ask you this. You've got, so you've got the book, The Crucible of Doubt, Reflections on the Quest for Faith. Uh, again, we're speaking with Terrell and Fiona Givens. Uh, where can people find the book? Amazon, oh, I, or Deseret. Deseret. <clears throat> we're really, <clears throat> excuse me, we're really delighted that Deseret was willing to, uh, to support this project and publish this book. We think it shows a great openness on their part to be part of this ongoing conversation that uh, is willing to, to re-examine our, our own assumptions about what constitutes faithful scholarship. Yeah, and, and I, I found, again, I found the book just to be amazing, and uh, I, I actually got it on audio first, listened to the whole thing on a trip uh, to Indiana and back, and uh, and then took the book and read it and made a bunch of notes in it. I really hope... You know, it's one thing, I get it, right? You guys have written a book and, and you certainly would like to see it to get into people's hands. But I, I really hope that those who are, are struggling with questions, those who have doubts, those who feel like they simply don't belong in the, in the church anymore, that they might pick this book up and, and read it and, and realize that there's just so much more room. I, I know that you guys would join with me in, in reiterating what President Uchtdorf said, which was that no matter where you're at with, with doubts or other issues, that there's room for you here and, and your book, I think, does a great job of making room for those Latter-day Saints who would see themselves on the fringe to once again jump in and be faithful members of the church. And and I would just add, too, that I often think we put so much emphasis on the things we think we know in our head, but just living a faithful life, to me, is much more important and has so much more um, so much more power in it. Uh, and I think it does a lot more in Heavenly Father's mind as well. Absolutely. Well, those are certainly the people for whom we wrote this book. Um, most of our friends and acquaintance fall into that category. And so I do hope they, they would, would read it. It's not a book about propaganda. It's essentially about faith journeys and how complex they are. And more importantly, that God understands how complex they are and he's not judging. And, um, so I hope there would be solace and balm to be found amidst the pages. It certainly was for Terrell and myself um, compiling the book and, um, you know, writing on those things and, and dwelling on these topics that really are at the heart of our faith journeys. Um, we are brothers and sisters, and I, I think it's really important that we do everything we can to to help, to help. Right. Right. I uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say one last thing, which was that every single person to a T who sent me a question, and I had I had maybe twenty twenty five of them total, 
every single one said, please tell Terrell and Fiona, thank you. Uh, many of them said you're a godsend and, and that the way in which you're opening up the dialogue within Mormonism um, has essentially given them the room to hang on and, and they're all, they've all been touched by each of you. And so I, I just want to say thanks to both of you for all your hard work. That's it.